Right, welcome to today's event. I'm Gemma Wankartley from Herefordshire Green Networks Building Sense Group, an initiative that was started in 2020 to bring together people, information and prof professional expertise to help with the challenge of making homes comfortable year round in the face of high heating bills and of course cutting carbon emissions. Today we're delighted to be hosting Lucy Pedler, um, architect and expert trainer on behalf of the Future Ready Homes programme, with support from the Green Register, who since 2000 has trained thousands of construction professionals from all disciplines of the industry to build better, more sustainable buildings. Future Ready Homes is a programme that's running in Shropshire, Powys and Herefordshire. It's being delivered by March's Energy Agency and 7Y Energy Agency, with the support of groups such as ourselves, HGN in Herefordshire, Lightfoot in Powys and Zero Carbon Shropshire in of course Shropshire. The main focus of the Future Ready Homes programme is to promote and support good practice energy retrofit across the Marches area. They're doing that through the webinar series, why we're here today, giving retrofit advice and things like Green Doors, which you may well have attended um, this month and it's just concluded three weekends of green open homes. So finally, I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, Lucy is an architect with 34 years of professional experience in the UK and USA, um, and has particular expertise in sustainable building practices. And she created the Green Register in 2000. In 99, she started her sustainable architecture practice, um, Archipelago, designing buildings that have low impact on the environment. And in 2005, joined by a colleague, um, they created a company that's offering refurbishments of existing buildings, usually ones in very poor condition, um, and transforming them into sustainable, beautiful buildings fit for the 21st century. Um, today, Lucy is going to help us understand how you can retrofit your solid wall home while keeping its character and what energy efficiency yeah. me measures would best suit this type of home. She'll be using her own home as a case study as well as others. Um, we expect the presentation to last about an hour and then there'll be questions after that. If people are running out of time, please put your questions in to the chat anyway and we'll see, we'll deal with them if we can and you can always listen to them on the recording if you do need to leave us. So Lucy, thank you ever so much and I shall hand over to you. Thank you so much, Gemma. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, the Herefordshire Green Network. Um, I'll share my screen as soon as you have Stop, Jules, Gemma. There we go. Wonderful, thank you. So, there we are. So, as Gemma says, uh, what we're going to talk about today is retrofitting solid wall homes, which I understand a lot of you have. Um, Gemma's just done such a great introduction of me that this slide was going to tell you where I come from and who I'm doing, so I can pass straight past that. Thank you, Gemma, and you've. Uh, one of the few people who've pronounced our architectural practice correctly. <laughs> so well done for that. Um, what we're going to talk about at lunchtime today is I am going to just talk about a few definitions and some terms, which is really important that we're all on the same page for some myths and so on, before having a very brief dive into what we call the whole house approach um, and list um, in one slide all the aspects of low carbon homes that I'm not going to talk about today, but need to be identified um, for a holistic approach. Then the, the meat or the tofu of the, um, the event is um, the solid walls, floors and roofs. But I'm also going to talk about windows and doors. Um, and finally, I'll be giving you some references for you to look at um, when, in your own time. So the first thing I wanted to identify is that the greenhouse effect is a very good thing. It's always presented as a negative because um, we are at the point where it is a negative, but without this uh, sort of duvet on the Earth's uh, atmosphere, the sun's energy that comes in would all leak back out again. So we used to have a very thin duvet and that um, allowed life on Earth. What we've done uh, due to human activity and pumping a lot of CO2 and other greenhouse gases is we've made that that duvet, not three tog, but 20 tog, perhaps. So a lot more of that sun's energy is getting reflected back into the earth, warming the earth, melting the ice caps and so on. So um, you can impress your friends if they talk about the greenhouse effect as a negative thing. You can tell them that actually we would not survive on earth without it. 
Um, the other aspect that I think is really important to talk about is that, you know, in my profession, we talk about uh, carbon in buildings, um, but there's other aspects of our lives where carbon can be reduced or um, significantly um, in eliminated. Um, so we we hear all the time about how it's bad to fly um, very small distances. Global aviation accounts for two to four percent of CO two, um, slightly higher in this country because we're an island and we do like to to fly to the med. Um, but if we were to look at our average CO2 equivalent, that E there is equivalent, so it's the other greenhouse gases apart from CO2, that each of us on this call, it's about six and a half tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. And the really interesting thing is how that's split up, because as I say, I tend to concentrate on this when I'm talking about um, CO2 and carbon because it's my area of expertise but we also have travel and we also have food miles and very broadly speaking it's about a third a third a third so we can affect change within our professional lives so for construction professionals but also in our lifestyles um, and then this is just to um, give you an idea about greenhouse gases and it being more than just carbon. So it's a trick question. When I'm in the room with people, I say, well, which produces more carbon dioxide emissions worldwide? Is it aviation? Is it concrete production or is it cows? Many people say cows, um, but actually it's concrete production. Um, and the reason why people say cows is that they know that, that um, cow farts essentially are very... Um, um, effective in reducing in uh, the greenhouse gases um, basket, but it's methane. So uh, methane has a global warming perform uh, performance of about 30 times CO2. The fact is that we as human beings produce so much CO2 in all our activities that despite methane being more potent, um, we usually measure greenhouse gases relating to CO2. So concrete is responsible for 8 10% globally of all our carbon emissions worldwide. Um, one thing that I'm going to use today is a really fantastic document. I've got the um, hard copy here called uh, A Bristolian's Guide to Solid Wall Insulation, which was produced by um, Bristol City Council in association with others. Um, it's now several years old, but actually it really doesn't matter because much of what's in there is still very relevant. Um, you can get it as a PDF. There's a link at the end of this um, presentation. But when we talk about um, terminology, you know, I know a lot of you aren't construction professionals on this call, and some of the jargon is really quite off-putting, and they put it in very clear English here about what the main um, issues are, for example, air tightness, what fabric means, um, moisture close, moisture open. So I would encourage you to um, have a look at that. Um, and as I say, there's a link um, at the end of this presentation. So I said I was going to talk about the things I'm not going to talk about. And the only reason I'm doing this very briefly is because when we're looking at the carbon impact of the building, whether it's a house or um, a non-residential building, is we have to have a holistic approach. It's more than just energy. So this is a graphic that we produced a, a while ago, and it shows you, well, it illustrates what could be potentially unintended consequences if you don't think of your building as a whole. So all of us are trying to reduce um, heat loss for all sorts of reasons, personal reasons to, due to fuel, comfort in the house and so on, climate change, all of the very good reasons. And one of the ways you can do that is to reduce um, good drafts, which is essentially what air tightness means. You're tightening up your floor, your walls and your roof, you're making it less drafty. So your heating system doesn't have to work so hard. But before you did that, some of the uncontrolled cold air that was coming in and making your heating system work harder was actually providing ventilation and keeping moisture control down to a minimum. And we'll see later quite how harmful moisture can be if it's in the wrong place in a building. So this is the whole house approach, looking at everything all together, and when you're doing measures to your own house, think about the building, if you can, as an holistic project. So the three areas that I'm really not going to talk about is water. Water has a very large carbon impact, both in cleaning it and in heating it. Fortunately, we've got lots of good ways of reducing consumption at the point of use. Low flush, dual flush toilets, aerators, low flush heads, shower heads. Wouldn't recommend grey water 
for residential you have to store it if you, if you store it you have to clean it somehow however rainwater is an excellent way of reducing your use of mains water which as i say has a carbon load um, and there's outside buildings too in terms of keeping the rain on your site and not overburning the sewage system so that's all i i have got time to say for for uh, water um this is a I probably use this every single presentation. It's my favorite slide ever. But basically it's, it illustrates very simply what we do with stuff. So we take stuff out of the ground, we make it into something, we use it for a bit and we demolish it. It's called cradle to grave. And we don't have an infinite amount of stuff on the planet. And so we have to make it a cradle to cradle approach. Um, I can talk endlessly on this subject, but um, you know when you're choosing the materials to refurbish your house, it is important if you can to try and use materials that have recycled content in them, perhaps natural insulation products um, and those that have a lower impact than some of the more conventional higher impact materials. The final subject I'm not going to talk about is low carbon technologies and it's important to distinguish between renewable energy technologies and low carbon technologies. So um, the distinction is really that um, low carbon technologies do what they sound like, they're using less energy to produce more heat, like condensing boilers, LED lighting and so on. And all the ones in black on the screen here are renewable energy technologies because they are using um, a source of energy, whether it's wind, sun, waves and so on, that is renewable. And I was asked just to very briefly touch on heat pumps. I know that um, the Building Retrofit in the Marshes project is now looking at heat pumps. Um, it's, it's a complicated subject, which I don't have time for, but I just wanted to show you two slides. That heat pumps doesn't always mean air source heat pumps. Um, it can be ground source heat pumps. It could be a water source heat pump. Uh, the really important thing to, measure, to, to remember when you're thinking of putting a heat pump is to consider whether your current heating system really is at the end of its useful life because it will go to landfill if it does. You know, to, is there a little bit more um, life in it and can you do other things in the fabric to lessen the amount of energy? Make sure you get independent advice in the house survey and I know that both Seven Energy and um, Marshes are doing really good work in this to uh, independently assess your house Identify all the practical measures you can do, do to reduce heat loss before you even think about a heat pump. Um, carry out as many of these as you can and make sure the size of the heat pump is adequate. So we have heard of um, companies which uh, are suggesting putting a heat pump in without the fabric first measures and people are just cold because it hasn't been properly assessed and the fabric isn't um, as insulating as enough as it should be before putting a heat pump in, which provides lower grade energy. So on to the tofu of the presentation then. So um, I'm hoping this is covering most of the house types that you guys live in. So flat back terrace without an extension, uh, terrace with an extension, end of terrace, semi-detached and detached. And my guess without polling you is that quite a lot of you will be living in detached houses where you've got all the walls exposed to the outside and you'll be probably suffering quite a lot of heat loss through those. Um, this is a graph from the um, Bristolians Guide to Solid Ball Insulation. And what's interesting about this is of the five, five house types, the colours are the different areas of the building where there's heat loss. And in all cases, this sort of muddy green is the heat loss of the external wall. So uh, if you want to get the most bang for your buck, insulating your walls is the most effective in reducing um, energy consumption and heat loss. It is, however, also the most expensive and possibly most, um, uh, most disruptive. Um, the blue, which is heat loss through the roof, which is the least in all of these cases, and that's because most of our houses um, have loft insulation at the moment. Not all, interestingly, but most of them do. So let's have a look at the types of wall insulation. And I'm using, as um, Gemma mentioned, my house, which I'm sitting in at the moment, to talk about external wall insulation. So I'm living in a 1934 house. It is detached, so all the walls are exposed. It's a nine inch brick wall with white render on it. Not a single bit of insulation when we moved back in in 2005. Um, and we wanted to externally insulate it 
um, because it felt like a better solution for our house. So the, the, the problems are is that some of the detailing can be a bit more tricky. So here we've got a special lead skirt that we had to create. Uh, this is 80 mil of polyisocyanurate insulation. It's a board form of insulation. It's only 50 here because otherwise it would have protruded beyond the tile hanging, which we kept. And I'll come back to why we kept that a little bit. Um, it's slightly more expensive than IWI. Uh, there's possibly planning issues. We weren't in a conservation area, um, but there's many, many um, pluses. You don't lose floor space because you're not internally lining your, um, your building. There's no loss of decorative features if you have beautiful cornices or dados or chair rails. Uh, it makes best use of thermal mass, which I'm going to come back to. Um, no cold bridging, which we'll come back to. And this is really what we did. We put a massive tea cosy um, over our house, both with the walls, the floors and the roof. And this was uh, during construction. So I'm up here right now talking to you. Um, this is mechanically applied directly onto the existing um, acrylic um, insulation, uh, sorry, um, render, and then it's in, uh, just rendered on top. So actually visually there's very little difference. We also um, changed our windows. They were the very thin crittle windows. So I've mentioned that uh, EWI is very good for thermal mass. Um, I'm not going to go into all the science here, but essentially the two main reasons why you'd use thermal mass and what that means is anything in the building that's heavy. So it could be brick in our case, we had a nine inch brick wall. It could be concrete, it could be block work. What that, what that does is it can take, it can absorb heat and act like a reservoir and keep the building cool. And in the nighttime, when you've got what's called nighttime cooling, you keep the windows open, it cools things down. So obviously this is in uh, the season when it's very warm. So if you look at this, this is the temperature swing with high thermal mass. And if you don't have thermal mass and you've just got, you know, just a regular nine inch um, brick wall or uh, maybe a framed building, it's going to swing a lot more. And it's more uncomfortable for us as human beings to live in buildings that have low thermal mass. Um, the other thing is it delays the inevitable peak temperatures, because as I say, this thermal mass is holding onto the heat, keeping it from heating up the room. Um, not so uh, much of an issue with residential, but say you're designing a school, you want to keep the classrooms cool. Doesn't really matter if the classrooms are up to 28, 29 degrees in the summer, you know, in the evening, because most people have gone home. And so this is one way of delaying the uh, peak temperatures. But I wanted to try this theory out in my house. So I contacted De Montfort University and we worked together for a year. And I had these little things that look like tiny padlocks and they're um, temperature monitors. They, they log the temperature. And every six weeks, I'd send them off to De Montfort University and they'd send them back into lovely graphs. So I had one um, temperature monitor outside. This is the blue. And then I had one on each of the floors. So living room, bedroom and loft. And this is over a week. We went away for Christmas. We turned the heating off um, and it was really pretty cold outside between five and 10 degrees. No time in the house did the temperature go below 14 and a half degrees. And that is because in the previous weeks prior to leaving, we'd had the heating on. The nine inch brick walk had, had heated up because of a big tea cozy, that heat had nowhere to go. So there was a lot of residual heat left over in the house. So I was quite happy to show that that bit of thermal, of, uh, thermal mass actually worked. This is um, the week before we went away, it was a bit colder outside and it's over a 24 hour period. And this shows the, the, the lack of extreme hot and cold temperatures. So in each of the floors, the temperature was range was quite uh, narrow, which left a very comfortable feeling in the house. Um, and this is actually in summer to show that external wall insulation can um, stop you overheating. So this is the temperature. Again, the colors are the same. Blue is external temperature. Internally, it was mainly quite comfortable, although this is obviously skewed because you also have the windows open in the summer. Um, we did actually uh, use a hybrid approach. That's what HWI means. So we talk about internal wall insulation and external wall insulation. And I mentioned that we wanted to keep this tile hanging. So what we did is we externally insulated all of this that is in white, but we internally 
insulated the little bit over the porch. And this was back in 2005. And what we really didn't realize at the time is that that gap between the inter internal and external needs to have an overlap. And this is using something called a thermal imaging camera, which is like a camera, but it takes the temperature of a surface and it converts it into color. And so the red is high temperatures. And that means we were losing some heat right at that junction between internal and external. So hybrid uh, wall insulation is fine. You just got to make sure you have an overlap between the two. Um, some of you may remember the Green Deal. This was um, a lot of money thrown at trying to encourage people to put external wall insulation, and it was an absolute catastrophe. Um, this is, um, there's a link down here from a, um, the Architects Journal. Um, what happened was a lot of very unskilled uh, people got a lot of money to put external wall insulation in very, very badly. Um, and in this particular case, they decided they wouldn't try and deal with this, what's called dental course at the top. Um, they'd just stop the insulation here. They put a little cap on it and silicon seal it. Seal it. Well, over time that sealant uh, moved, it shifted and water started to go behind the uh, external wall insulation, producing huge amounts of mold, mushrooms on the wall. They had to take everything down. And it was to do with the fact that it, it simply was done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Um, it is very difficult sometimes to do EWI with historic buildings that have got a lot of external detailing. And so internal wall insulation may be a solution. Um, the Brestolian Guide to Solid Wall has got some excellent detailing to show you how not to do it. That's the one we've just seen where you just stop the insulation and you've got what's called a cold bridge, which means the, the insulation isn't continuous. And this is what you should be doing. Fortunately, we've got lots of other types of cladding materials that can go outside uh, EWI external wall insulation. And so you can still retain the look. This is actually brick slips and so not full bricks that's gone on external wall insulation. So we're getting much better um, at doing this over the years. Um, when you look at internal wall insulation, EW, IWI, basically the pros and cons are the opposite of the EWI, but there's two points to make here, is that um, if you've got an older building, say for example, you've got, you're living in a cottage with 500 mil fixed stone walls, um, and you put internal wall insulation, over the year, uh, the, uh, the wall will have um, it been the beneficiary of some residual heat that's come from inside when you have your heating on, and it staves off frost, frost, if you internally insulate, you're stopping that residual heat getting into the wall. And people like the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings are very worried about that wall cooling down to the point where external walls could actually um, uh, produce gaps and you might get some fractures in the mortar and so on. So that's certainly something to have a look at. But the most important thing, I cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough, is that with both types, but particularly IWI, the risk of interstitial condensation has to be managed. So um, there's a lot of building physics um, about this, which I'm not really going to go into, but basically what you do when you put internal wall insulation is you move what's called the dew point. And the dew point is where airborne moisture inside, you know, we're producing it by uh, breathing, by showering, by cooking, that airborne moisture gets into the wall or the floor of the roof and it condenses. So the dew point is where it goes from airborne moisture to droplets of moisture. And if you put IWI in, you're increasing that chance of that happening behind the scenes and producing damage to the fabric. So um, it's not all doom and gloom, you just have to know what you're doing, but that is a serious risk. Now this is showing a product which has since been taken off the market as a result of that risk where um, the, the owners went out, the internal wall insulation was put on. Um, you can see here there's a, a decorative cornice here. And what the owners decided to uh, accept is that this extra, uh, this internal wall insulation would cover up a little bit of that cornice, which isn't, which isn't too elaborate. They were quite happy with that. What happens, though, if you have a very, very decorative um, internal um, cornice, dado, chair rail, and so on? 
Um, it is much more difficult. There's very few answers to this. I've had a lot of delegates that say, well, you just put the insulation up to the cornice and leave it there, but you get the same problem there is if this is an external wall, you've insulated this nicely, you've now got what's called a cold bridge at the cornice. And the problem with cold bridges is it attracts moisture. So um, if the conservation officer will let you take it down, you could take it down, put the insulation up and put it back up. You could take a mold of it. Um, you could you could do other things in the house that aren't to do with that. Uh, you could move, uh, whatever, and that works. But the, the idea of uh, internal uh, wall insulation and the risks of interstitial condensation are very high. And Historic Scotland did a really interesting 12-month um, survey where they put IWI in various different parts of a tenement building in Glasgow. So this is, for example, uh, blown cellulose, this is hemp. And over a 12 month period, they monitored the amount of moisture behind the insulation. So this goes back to my point about uh, moisture getting behind condensing and causing damage. This is a little temperature uh, moisture monitor. They managed to do it for 12 months for all different types of insulation materials. And this result, this um, report, which is here, um, said that actually there was no uh, in, there was no worry about the insulation mirrors. It didn't increase significantly the amount of moisture over time. However, I would put a great big caveat here because this is a particular building in a particular part of the country with a particular exposure, particular construction, and by no means can you take that as a passport to putting IWI without thinking carefully about it. And the reason why moisture is so, so important to control, the World Health Organization identified that, you know, three quarters of building defects are as a result of some kind of moisture where it shouldn't be. So it might be rising damp, it might be penetrating damp due to rainwater goods being faulty, uh, it might be spalling brickwork, it might be bad detailing around timber. Timber's great as long as it stays dry. You put it in a damp wall um, and it starts to rot. And of course, it could be also airborne moisture within the building. Moisture is extremely damaging to all parts of the building. And when you're thinking of improving your house, um, this is probably because of this, one of the most important things you need to consider with any measure that you're doing. And I'll show you quite a staggering a uh, study that was done in Germany where they they uh, looked at very tiny gaps in the walls or roof or floor, but this was a wall, um, and to see what the implications are with these tiny gaps. So this was um, just a bit of wall. It was uh, 140 mil thick, and this is what's called a vapour check, which stops most of the moisture getting through. And with there with no gaps, only 0.5 of a gram of water per square metre passed through that uh, laboratory sample over a 24 hour period. Then they cut a one millimeter gap in that vapor check. So one millimeter is tiny. Uh, unfortunately, you see that all over building sites, tiny little unintended gaps. And instead of 0.5 of a gram of water, you had 800 grams of water going across that over 24 hours. So you can see how important it is to manage water moisture in buildings. And of course we have lots of gaps in our buildings. As I alluded to first, if you're living in a very leaky house, um, you're getting what's lo a lot, what's called, um, um, so sorry about that gap, everybody, but there's gaps on the screen here and that's gaps in your external envelope. So that is uh, not meant to be like that. We all know where these gaps in our houses are and what I was what I was saying was that um, if you have an old house and you've got lots of drafts what's it what's called is is uncontrolled uh, infiltration of cold air so you won't have so much trouble with moisture but you will be cold all the time and your heating system will be working very hard so the concept of air tightness is that we need to cut down all of these drafts but we need, then need to introduce controlled ventilation so we don't get that buildup of moisture. And this is a really interesting graph that shows, um, there's a guy called uh, Paul Jennings who does a lot of air tightness um, in the UK. And this shows um, the, the blue is, it says other energy losses, that means through the floors, walls and roofs of, of, of our houses. So pre-1981, which we weren't really that 
affected. Uh, we didn't really know much about heat loss. Uh, we didn't know much about energy saving and so on. Most of the heat loss was through our walls, floors and roof. Then the building regulations start to tighten it up. And in the future, we may well be getting more heat loss through uh, unintended drafts and gaps in the building compared to our walls, floors and roofs because we're getting so much better at uh, insulating our buildings. Um, I wanted to share with you another um, case study here, which as an architectural practice we did, where we were considering whether to do internal or external wall insulation or possibly a hybrid. So this is an old church hall in Eastern Bristol. And uh, we bought it with the intention of slicing it up into three little starter homes. So they would all be little houses, very um, well designed, very uh, low impact for uh, first time buyers, um, or actually people who couldn't even get one rung up on the ladder, probably half a rung. But this wall, which was 500 mil stone and rubble, was absolutely saturated because this, the church had not been using the hall for many years. So it was completely saturated with water. Um, we uh, didn't consider external wall insulation because we liked the brick detailing. So we were looking at internal wall insulation, but we knew there was going to be a risk as the, as the wall dried out of that water getting into the insulation. So I looked at all the various products that I'm familiar with and I'm comfortable with specifying. And the one that I would probably have gone with had I not been advised against is something called wood fiber insulation, which can be used internally, externally on roofs, on uh, floors and so on. It's a fantastically versatile insulation. But when I uh, called up the manufacturer and I said, look, this is the situation, it's a saturated wall, I'm thinking of lining internally, putting wood fiber in, he said, well, essentially what you've got is an organic material, wood, uh, moisture from the walls um, and heat. And that means compost. In other words, it wouldn't be able to tolerate that level of moisture as it dried out. So what we use was this product called diathonite, which is a cork and lime spray. And this is it being put in on the inside. Um, and it's the only product that we had the confidence in that would be able to tolerate that moisture as it dried out, which it did indeed dry out. Um, but it was expensive. These were small starter flats and we didn't want to put too thick lining on the inside. So we ended up with 60 mil of this diathonite. And I rather nervously contacted the building control officer in South Gloucestershire and said, look, this is the situation. It's a saturated wall. I'm not confident in any other material except this is an insulation. However, we're not going to be able to achieve uh, the required U value. Um, but it's the safest one for this particular project. Uh, so we've got a U value of 0.58 and she completely got it. I think I was very lucky. Uh, the building control officer understood it and we got it passed. Um, I just want to also, it's often asked of us, how much insulation is enough insulation? You know, if you've got a limited budget, how much do you put on insulation and how much do you put on other measures? Um, now, don't worry about the, um, the, the figures here. You know, if it costs £90 a year to heat a house, I wish. Um, but it's a, it's a relative exercise. So if it costs £90 a year to heat a house with 50 mil of insulation, how, would, how much would it cost if you doubled that? And, you know, the obvious knee-jerk reaction is, well, it would be £45, but actually it wouldn't be because there's a law of diminishing returns. So this is a very simple graph with insulation thickness along the bottom and cost of heating up the side. And unsurprisingly, if you only put a tiny amount of insulation, 50 mil, your heating costs are going to be very high. Double that insulation and they've gone down considerably. But as you put more and more insulation, it flattens out and there's a kind of optimum amount of insulation around the 250, 300. Quite apart from the kind of practical aspects of putting that much insulation in your walls. So um, I thought that would be helpful. But it also does, of course, depend on where you're putting the insulation. So this is another extract from the Bristolian's Guide to Wall Insulation. Um, and this is a detached house, which is what I am guessing a lot of you live in. And if you compare something like loft insulation, it's very cheap, it's very quick payback, instant comfort benefit, disruption is very low unless you have, you know, all your children's stuff in the attic and you have to move it. 
Um, you compare that to the wall insulations down here, EW, IW, and HWI, um, very high costs, long payback, very, com very high comfort benefit. I mean, actually, they've said that for all of them. Um, and the disruption is at its highest if you're putting internal wall insulation, as you can imagine, because you have you're you're disrupting um, your home as opposed to putting it on the outside. So let's have a look at floor insulation. So there's two types of floors: there's solid wall, the solid floors, and there's um, suspended timber floors. So I'm using a case case study in Edinburgh of a tenement building. Um, and Nick Heath, one of my colleagues, kindly allowed me to use his slides here. Um, and it's very tricky with solid floors. What you really want to do is to take the slab up, insulate underneath, and put the slab back down again. A, because you're making the slab a thermally massive, active part of the building, but also you're keeping the final floor levels the same. Um, because if you add insulation on the top of a solid floor, you're adjusting uh, skirtings, door thresholds, the first riser on a, a stair is going to be shorter and so on. So there's this, this material which minimizes that, it doesn't eliminate it, um, called Space Therm. It's an aerogel project, a product that came out of the NASA um, project. And it's very, very, very effective and very, very small thicknesses. It's also very expensive, so you use it judicially. But this is um, it, this is the aerogel here backed onto a hardboard, and you can get a wall version too backed onto chipboard as well. So you can have a look into that. For example, you could just use it on uh, window um, reveals where it's very you, you need a very thin insulant there relative to the thicker insulation you put on the rest of the walls. Um, this again is my house. Um, this is my younger brother. Uh, lining the joist pockets of our ground floor in a suspended timber floor. Um, and we've got a crawl space underneath. And you'll know um, possibly from your own house that air bricks are introduced on the perimeter to make sure that these timbers stay dry. Before we bought the building, the previous owner had built up the flower beds and breached that damp proof course. And it meant that all the timbers were uh, damp. So we had to take all the joists out, put new ones in, and I introduced um, at fresh air with the air brick. So this is a section through the wall, floor rather. These are the joists. This is the breather membrane that my brother was putting in. And uh, this is the insulation, it was blown cellulose. And then really importantly, the junction between the wall and the floor is uh, often where this cold air is coming in. So I put a plastic sheet over the top and ideally what you want to do is to take that plastic sheet to reduce the amount of cold air that's coming in that you need to keep the timbers dry, but doesn't come into your house. Um, onto roof insulation. So um, this is kind of hand on my heart, really. This was this is the room actually I'm in at the moment. So we converted our loft into our office and we were living in London at the time. And so we weren't able to supervise the work as much as we wanted to. And this is how not to do a vapor check in a roof. I have to say, we've not got any visible um, problems with the result, with it, as the fact that it was so, done so badly. Um, but we very shortly after that fell out with the builder and we got a new builder. But what we did was we took off the roof tiles. You know, we had no um, boundaries with other houses, so we could do that. It was a simple hipped roof. So we took all the tiles off, stored them, we put um, insulation between the rafters here, and then crucially, we put insulation at 90 degrees on top of those. So any gaps that might have appeared between this insulation and the rafters were covered up by the roof, by the um, insulation that was going at right angles. Um, and this is a picture looking out of the window showing you the breather membrane and the counter battens and the old tiles going back on again. So, um, you probably gather by now I'm a bit of a geek with my house. So we did some thermal imaging of um, our house once we'd finished it. So uh, just a reminder again, that's a camera that looks at surfaces and converts them into color. And um, in this respect, this is a camera up a 30 foot pole. Um, what you don't want to see is these sort of colors. So this is looking at the loft and very satisfyingly, there are no gaps in that insulation because of the way that we did the the cross um, laying of the insulation. This is a little extract fan because we've got a shower room up here. These are our solar thermal panels and this poor 
neighbour of ours could well do with some insulation, I think. Um, now, the next one, I've, gab I've sort of gathered these all together. I mean, they're all related, you know, as I said at the beginning, everything's interrelated. But these four are probably more closely related. So that's moisture movement, air tightness, indoor air quality, that is uh, what we breathe inside, and ventilation. Um, and this is worthy of a subject on its own, but we've already established that moisture in the wrong place is extremely damaging. And the way that you uh, you deal with that is that you increase the air tightness, but you provide uh, control ventilation. Um, but if you're living in a house that's got poor ventilation and it's very damp, unfortunately, you can get a lot of health related issues. So poor indoor air quality leads to mold growth particularly those people who have respiratory diseases like asthma. Um, it's linked to other um, symptoms that are poor, poor health, um, but the solution is fairly straightforward. It's some kind of ventilation strategy. Um, there's a very good link here um, that shows you problems caused by poor ventilation. And of course, it's not just poor health. Um, Awak uh, father said that his little son died as a result of mold in their flat even though he's repeatedly asked the council to um, come and do something so it's a serious issue and uh, we've lost our but actually what he's done is he's made a legally um, established case that you can die from um, a poor internal air quality so uh, going on to windows and doors and um, for those of you who are very observant you will notice that this representation of the percentage of heat loss throughout a house is different to the one that I showed earlier. And that's deliberate because these are very, very rough figures. You know, it will depend uh, what kind of, do you have crystal windows? Do you have double glazed windows? Do you have triple glazed windows? You know, so it's very, very variable. It was 10% in the other slide and it's 20% in, 26% in windows. But essentially there's four different types of things you can do uh, with windows. You can add secondary glazing, you can draft proof them, uh, you can do shutter replacement, uh, you can do double glazing, either replacing the whole window with a double gla or triple glaze unit or individually replacing the glazing units. So um, this again is the tenement building in Edinburgh that I showed you earlier. And Nick Heath is the person who shared the slides for me. So you may or may not know that for conservation officers, um, double glazing is very offensive to them. And the main reason it's offensive is because of the second pane of the double glazing reflecting back out and it changes the look of the building. This is secondary glazing, which has the reflective surface on it that does the same thing as double glazing, but it's more acceptable to conservation officers. Um, presumably because it's removable at some time in the future when we have no problems with carbon emissions, we can take that secondary glazing out, but it's certainly favoured by conservation officers. Um, in this particular project, um, they couldn't use robust, heavy secondary glazing because it would have intruded into the room um, and you'd be unable to use the existing shutters and so on. So what they did in this case is they used a very thin frame aluminium secondary glazing from a company called Storm Windows. Um, and as you can see, they are extremely thin and they're applied internally into the primary glazing and they operate in the same way as the, sec as the primary glazing. So when this secondary glazing is shut, you don't see that horizontal bar. And it certainly improves things. It improves in acoustically, but also thermally. So um, this is a window that hasn't had any secondary glazing, and this is a much cosier secondary glazed window. Uh, the second option is possibly to uh, put draft proofing in. Um, that's quite costly. Um, some conservationists don't like it because you have to route out bits of the frame to put the brushes in. Um, but it certainly deals with the problem with double hung sashes, you know, the, the windows that slide over each other, they have to be leaky because they have to be able to move over each other. And so putting these brushes in allows the windows to move, but it stops all the drafts. And uh, if you're if you're living in a house that's got a box um, frame, double hung sash, you can take the whole unit out um, and do that job of draft proofing um, in situ in a day. 
The third option in this particular um, project, I don't know how many of you might have shutters, is to reinstate them. So that's very much favoured by conservation officers because it's reinstating the original features. Um, it does not do much for heat loss for two reasons. Um, they're loose fitting timber. There's not any major intrinsic insulation value in timber. And of course, it's only a nighttime solution unless you don't mind living in the dark. So uh, Nick, my colleague, thought, well, um, we, you know, we did ask at the beginning if we could just put the, the double glazing in. These, by the way, are not the original windows. These are 1990-bit windows. Conservation officer did not want those replaced. Uh, Nick said that he, his client would pay for historically accurate double glazing. Uh, conservation officer said no. Um, so what he suggested to his client is to just replace one window with a double glazed unit, invite the conservation officer around and ask her to see if she could tell which of those windows had double glazing in it. Before I show you which one, what they actually did was rather than replace the entire framed unit, they put what's called slimline double glazing, which is an excellent solution. And many um, planning authorities around the country are happy with this solution, particularly in the windows on, on the backs of buildings. You take out the original single glazing and you put this slim line double glazing in. And this was the window with a double glazed unit in it. Conservation officer could not point out which one it was. And as a result, Edinburgh Council changed its policy, not to blanket accept all double glazing for all listed or historic buildings, but they were open to, um, they were open to this now. And in fact, where I live in Bath, which is also a very um, a beautiful um, world heritage uh, city, has changed its rules to in terms of double glazing and listed buildings. <clears throat> uh, so this is my the back of my house. And I, I did this recording for a, a presentation a while ago. I'm, I'm just going to let the, the video play. It's just talking to you about the importance of the positioning if you're putting new windows in your existing wall. When we bought the house, it had old metal crittle windows and the windows were so leaky that you could almost see the daylight coming through. So one of the things we wanted to do was to replace the windows with high performance double glaze windows. Now, the really important thing when you're doing wall insulation and windows is to get an overlap between the insulation, which in our case is external wall insulation and the windows because you can imagine if you've got the external wall insulation and the window is set back, you've got a gap called a cold bridge between the insulation and the window. So what we've done is we've placed our windows as far forward as we can so that we can overlap the insulation and avoid that thermal bridge. And it's even more tricky if you're not replacing the windows because the windows are where they are and you have to do a special detail if you're putting wall insulation, whether it's external or internal wall insulation. So that's a detail that's really important when you're improving the performance of a wall. And so we did indeed do that. Um, we pulled the new windows, these are double glade windows, right up to overlap the uh, insulation. Um, and we instructed the uh, builders to put them in a certain position, but these were the builders that we eventually um, had to part uh, company with because this is the sill, this bit here is the sill that comes with the window and they positioned it such that the sill was in line with the final finish of the external wall with no what's called drip edge. So if there was any rain on this, it would just drip down the edge and make horrible uh, stains on the wall. So we had to plant new timber strips on each of these um, these new windows. So um, I'm just going to um, finish up with, because I can see there's a lots of questions, finish up with some references. So as you've gathered, I'm, I live in um, Bristol and Bath has done lots of excellent work, um, despite having such incredibly beautiful historic buildings. Um, so this is um, called Warmer Bath. Um, it's an old document, but as I said at the beginning, a lot of these are several years old, but they're still highly relevant today. And you can get this by going to the Centre for Sustainable Energy's website. They've got a PDF of it. Um, and what I like about it and what I like about Nick's um, presentations is that 
there's, there appears to be an apparent um, uh, sort of fight between conservation officers and people who want to improve the sustainability of their their houses and their other buildings but it isn't as black and white as that and we don't need to sort of stand in each other in opposite corners because there is an awful lot of overlap and there's an awful lot you can do with older homes without destroying um, the historic fabric of it. Um, Bath has also done lots of extremely good um, planning guidance. I helped write one of them uh, on the retrofitting um, and construction uh, one so that's all available if you want to have a look at that and just to give you an example I mean I know this is tiny but this just shows you all the various areas that they are looking at in their documents I mean here you've got the wall insulation but you've also got heat pumps and other different types of um, low carbon heating um, lots of detailing even in electric charging infrastructure and so on so uh, you probably aren't living in Bath but it doesn't matter there's a lot of information <clears throat> there this is the solid wall insulation that I've been referring to. So the council did this in collaboration with the STBA, which I'll explain in a minute. And again, um, there's a PDF that's freely available. It is one of the best guides, uh, most accessible, very clearly written, jargon free. Well, there's a glossary. Um, so I would highly recommend looking at that. Um, and then these are three other companies uh, who organizations you may or may not come across um, so I've mentioned the STBA, this is Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance, there's their website. Um, I've mentioned earlier on the Society Protect, uh, that should be Protection of Ancient Building, SPAB. Um, this one is the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products. So if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I was urging you to think about the materials you're using when you're trying to improve the energy performance of your uh, house and they have huge amounts of information, lots of free seminars and so on. Um, and just on Friday, I was, I was contacted by Jeffrey Smith, who's a longtime Green Register member. Um, and he alerted me to this book that he's just finished reading, writing called Insulate. And there's the ISBN number there. Um, and he's written it um, with lay people in mind so it's very accessible um, and he wants to, he says he wants a kind of mum's net version <laughs> of um, home, home owners and home occupiers insulating and improving their houses. So um, you'll get a copy of this um, and you can have a look at whether that's interest to you. So there we go, Gemma, that's finished and I'm sure there'll be some questions. Lovely. Oh, thank you so much, um, Lucy. And can I just say on behalf of HEN, we apologise to you, Lucy, and to everyone else for that technical glitch. Um, no problem. <laughs> we have tracked down the problem. Um, it shouldn't have happened and it won't happen again. Um, but yes, thank you for continuing and thank you everyone for coming back in. I think that just shows um, just how, um, what interesting the content has been or else people wouldn't have come back in and it has been it's been really fascinating right. um hopefully people haven't lost too much of the information William I did see your comment um and that you did miss some of it because of the glitch as Lucy had mentioned and we said at the start we will be circulating the recording we'll be circulating the slides as well um and all those references so you can dip back in to that that middle area um we think we've captured most of the questions from the front part, but we might not have got them all. So if you want to chuck your questions back in the chat now, please do. Um, yeah, and I shall hand over to Tony to um, share the questions with Lucy. There were quite a few flying in. Yes, don't please don't throw in too many more questions. We've got uh, we've got <laughs> half an hour. We're going to have to be quick. There was a huge amount of content, Lucy. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if I wanted to kick off, actually, because it really interests me. This... Um, the heritage aspect that, uh, as you say, working with Bath, as you were saying, um, and yes, I agree wholeheartedly, it doesn't need to be a, a fight. Um, the, um, obviously, heritage um, authorities are very interested in preserving buildings and looking after them. Um, we're interested, perhaps, in, in carbon savings. Um, but, I mean, cost is so often the problem, isn't it? Um, we, I'm sure you you would hate it, but I'm in a conservation he area here in Shrewsbury. Um, Neighbours of mine who have leaky, horrible old, um, you know, original Victorian sashes that their timber, um, they're, they're in need of repair. Um, the conservation officer has said 
categorically um, that UPVC double glazed sashes are not okay. You know, they 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 do their best. They look the part. They're sympathetic ish, but they are plastic. So any replacement windows have got to be timber, um, which is perhaps fair enough. But it means effectively it means she's not going to replace them. Uh, the rooms will continue to be cold. Uh, water will continue to penetrate into the the timber that's deteriorating. Um, you know, are, are you seeing any evidence of heritage uh, conservation officers perhaps, um, well, being less fussy, if I can put it like that? Um, you know, if if carbon yeah. is sort of going further up the agenda and and heritage concerns are, are being slightly more. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's so patchy, Tony, because it depends very much on the individual. You know, the, you you have picked up quite rightly that I have great difficulty uh, with some conservation officers. Uh, they're a they're a bottleneck in the whole um, process, and uh, we do have to change and be a bit more relaxed about what we do with our um, historic buildings. So there are some who are really really brilliant. You know, as I say, that a lot of them have accepted the slimline double glazing. Um, and uh, they're getting pressure from colleagues too. You know, most councils have a climate uh, declaration emergency. They've got to achieve them, and they are complete uh, loggerheads with this because some mm. of the things that are being prevented from being done um, are making it more difficult to achieve those um, targets. And if you look at somewhere like Germany, they will just put double glazing in the historic buildings. It's not even an issue. Of course you would. It's cold. We need to keep the heat in. And we actually, more importantly, want to make these buildings um, desirable to live in. Because if they're very cold and very leaky, they won't be uh, valuable to live in because they'll just be too uncomfortable. Um, the PVC thing uh, is a rare case where I do actually agree with the conservation officer because um, I do think PVC is a totally... Um, inappropriate material for windows. Um, they're they're cheap if they're the cheap end of UPVC. The higher quality UPVCs can be comparable with off the shelf timber. And of course, you don't have to do all the windows at once. You can do them mm. as you can afford them. So maybe do the north facing ones or the ones that are most rotten first, or put secondary glazing in, um, which as we've seen does make a big difference. Mm. Um, just on that, we had a curious exchange as to whether. Uh, Anna made a comment, secondary glazing is actually more effective than triple glazing. I suppose it, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts? Uh, I don't I don't know whether that's true or not. The person wrote it probably um, has some good data on that. Um, it's visual a lot of it is with the secondary glazing. You no, know, uh, you have to have two methods. You, you have to open two sets of windows um it can be cluttering once the seal goes you'll get moisture going in between the secondary and the primary glazing and you'll get moisture getting trapped in there there are there are problems with secondary glazing but you know i, th I think it's a, a fine solution for some um for some solutions it's it's not a universal answer not a okay. universal solution yeah um right let's get on to walls um we had a, a suggestion from Claire, again, a, a, a money-saving um, suggestion. Um, any thoughts on using internal wall insulation in just one room, presumably the, the room that is used most often? Absolutely, Claire. I think I think that's a fine um, idea. And it's, it's something you can do with IWI that is much more difficult to do with EWI. I mean, you could arguably do one, one face of a building with EWI, but... Um, Often the trigger will be something like, oh, I'm um, I'm going to update my kitchen, you know, and often kitchens are in back extensions, they're poorly built, they're the coldest part of the house. Great, you know, take the kitchen units out, internally um, insulate with some appropriate professional advice, and then put the units back in. No reason why you can't do it with a room by room approach. Mm -hmm. Um, just to yeah, pick up on a point that George made, um, often there, there will be a cold bridge if you insulate internally and you stop at the ceiling and then start again at the floor above, mm -hmm. uh, so you've not gone through the ceiling space, um, there will be a, a, a cold bridge there. Uh, so insulation should be continuous uh, through that floor. Um, presumably that's another advantage of external wall insulation in that you, you don't have that problem to deal with. You just go straight up the wall. Yeah, that's absolutely right, George. And um, 
you know, there's lots of details out there about how to um, either go from above or below, take the floorboards up, put the insulation between the joists. You know, you still technically have the cold bridge where the joists hit the the uh, wall. Um, and there's there's a standard called Passive House that some of you might have heard of. And there's a, um, a standard called Enefit, which is Passive House for retrofit for existing buildings. Um, and there was one project in London that got an Enefit certificate, but the only way they could achieve it was to take every joist out, cut it back, put a steel beam that went from party wall to party wall, and then they were able to insulate the entire external wall without interruption. Now, that's completely un affordable for just about everybody but um you know he's he's absolutely i think it was george he's absolutely right that that is a key thing to try and make continuity of insulation um okay thank you very much um i've got a couple of specific questions um you were talking about thermal mass of your your nine inch i think brick wall mm -hmm. um ian is trying to trump you he, he's saying what about the thermal mass of my 18 inch stone wall presumably that's I mean, would that be considerably greater? No competition, Ian. You win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Um, a particular product has been mentioned, um, I think, for... Is this for external? Right, again, solid stone walls. Imelda is asking about a product called Proof Shield. I'm sure many others are available. It's a, a perlite uh, filled with a lime binder. Have you got any views on that particular product? Um, I don't know the particular product. I know that perlite was used as <clears throat> a cavity, a retrofit for cavity wall insulation. Yeah. Um, because, you, you know, you, with the blown fiber insulation in cavity walls, um, post um, completion thermographic images were showing that it often slumped or it didn't fill the cavity, whereas perlite does. And it, it because it's silicon covered, um, it can tolerate the moisture in a cavity. So the only application I know of perlite is is that, and I don't know if that's what the uh, question refers to. Um, yeah, it's also used in in chimneys, I think, isn't it, for the same sort it of. It is reason. indeed. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, perhaps um, could we go into a bit more detail on the, the sloping ceiling insulation? I know it's something we come up against again and again. A lot of people who've done loft conversions, a lot of loft conversions, maybe done in the eighties and the nineties, don't uh, may not have any insulation at all. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned having insulation between the rafters and over it at 90 degrees. Could you could you tell us about the product you used and the, the thickness? Mm. I could. And, and before I answer that, um, Tony, not everybody can take their roof finish off, whether it's slates or, or tiles. Uh, we were able to, um, and that is quite definitely the, the platinum solution because then you can do what we did. If you can't take your roof finish off, you're having to put insulation from the inside and you have to you have to um, create a ventilation gap in the insulation that you're putting in to make sure that the roof rafters stay dry. So it's much more tricky if you can't take the roof finish off. So what we did is we took the tiles off. So all you had was exposed rafters. We used a mineral wool. Um, so we used um, lots of different types of insulin. So bearing in mind that we did this in 2015, there was a lot less information then than there is now, uh, which is why we ended up using a polyisocyanurate, um, a synthetic insulin for the walls, whereas I would use wall uh, wood fibre now. So um, we, we use cellulose on the ground floor because it's a great uh, recycled material. But in the roof, um, we couldn't get the material that would have done this cross um, installation. So in a natural insulin, so we used a mineral fiber. So it's called rock wool. Yeah. It's basically taking rock and heating it up to 1500 degrees C and spinning it. It's, it's not environmentally friendly, but we bought um, sort of bat forms, which are able to be squished in. So you slightly overcut them to the size of the rafters. Of course, existing builders, no rafters are parallel. So you can't ever get a full fit. So if you slightly overcut them, you can scrunch them up a bit and then friction fit them in between the rafters. And then they sort of expand to adjust to the slightly unparallel um, nature of the existing rafters. And then we just simply put a bat form, which is slightly rid more rigid at 90 degrees on top of the rafters. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I should say. Yeah, so uh, wood fibre is available in, in both of those forms now. The, the it is. stuff. I think um, Pavitex make one that could be 
friction fit in between rafters. Uh, I mean, you... wood fiber is, uh, is such a wonderful, versatile material. Um, we not only could only find one installer in Bristol that would do external wall insulation, but they only had one material. You know, that was uh, 18 years ago. I would certainly use wood fiber now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're back to EWI. Um, the question is, are EWI tiles which look like bricks breathable? I think that's the brick slips, I presume you were referring to. Uh -huh. um, can you use them on a solid brick wall? So question I would rephrase that as is um, for solid uh, construction, what uh, would you recommend for external wall insulation, which is, is vapor open? Okay, so I'm I'm actually not going to answer that because it is so project specific. Um, I mean, I think I would avoid um, any synthetic insulation at all at, 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 at every possibility. I appreciate that synthetic, you know, the synthetic insulins, so the polystyrenes, the um, all the closed cell insulins, all the ones that are from fossil fuels, um, they're incredibly effective and they're cheap. Um, and we are still in competition with them when we're looking at natural insulins. So I realize that what I'm suggesting is a more expensive solution. But until we start specifying these natural insulins, we're, ne we're never going to allow the manufacturers to get economies of scale and start to reduce their costs. So um, that's a really um, torturous answer. Um, I wouldn't recommend any particular insulation until I'd seen the site. I think wood fiber is appropriate in quite a lot of solutions um it, you know it's rigid enough that you may well be able to put the brick slips on i don't actually i don't actually know <clears throat> okay um just to keep on the same point are, are there any particular considerations for ewy for a detached wool away bungalow that's a, a sort of a system built bungalow is that right I, i'm not familiar with them okay um, well, um Move on. Okay. Um, useful question. Um, the same thing. Should you install the ventilation first before installing IWI or EWI or afterwards? Presumably, uh, the answer is actually at the same time. Yeah, it is. It's at the same time. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, you know, the more you tighten up the building, and it often comes with wall insulation that you are tightening up the building, the more you need to manage that ventilation. Um, and it goes hand in hand, as Tony's yeah, suggesting. Yeah. It should be designed in. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, uh, really pre excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, DPC, we haven't talked a lot about damp proof course. Um, the question is, is a damp proof course absolutely necessary if the floor and the wall insulation are correctly laced? Um, there's a difference between moisture control and insulating. Um, I'm sorry. not sure I understand the question. No. Do, you, do you and can you rephrase it? Um, well, um, uh, no, I'm not sure I do. Um, a lot of older properties, which we've been talking about, obviously don't have damp proof courses. So, so perhaps you could remind us, what was your brother helping with, um, when you had, you redid your suspended timber floor? Yeah. Made sure you ventilate correctly. So we had a DPC, it was put in in 1934 when the house was built. Right. Um, and it was breached by the flower beds, so the moisture was coming in over the top. Um, I mean, as an architect, I would always put a DPC in, but if you're living in a house that doesn't have one, um, again, I, I don't think I want to answer that because I think it just is very specific. I was told a really, I, I suspect it's a bit of a myth, that there was a, uh, there was a cob house in um, Suffolk, which... Um, what's that the owner was trying to get a mortgage of and the mortgage lender said but it doesn't have a dpc uh and the owner was trying to say no but that's because that's its traditional building doesn't need a dpc the lender said well i'm not going to i'm not going to allow you to get a mortgage or i'm not going to lend you any money until you put a dpc they put a dpc and the building slipped off the dpc because it was just disconnected with the ground i suspect that was a complete myth okay um Quick question. I'm interested in grants available to landlords. Well, I'm a landlord. I'd be very interested too. Um, I'd say, what have we got at the moment? The boiler upgrade scheme. Obviously, it's just been upgraded to <clears throat> seven thousand five hundred. Yeah. So um, you can put those um, 
uh, air source heat pumps in um, along with other energy efficiency measures. Um, possibly the Great British Insulation Scheme may be worth looking at um, such that it's coming together. Um, uh, I think that's more more um, our field than yours, Lucy. Yeah, at the um, boiler upgrade scheme is the only one that I'm aware of. Hmm. And of course, it's um, I, I'm also a landlady. Um, it's it's uh, becoming extremely important to make sure your the buildings that you let out are um, well uh, maintained because you'll no longer be able to rent them out if they've got an EPC below. I think it's E now. It keeps going up, doesn't it? But, you know, finally, we're getting an EPC with some teeth that actually means something. Yeah, yeah it is EPC E currently. Um, okay. Right. I'm delighted to have a question from a builder. Chris is here. Uh, my question is, as a competent builder, how does one go about getting design advice on detailing to avoid the types of problems you talked about during the work yourself, is educating yourself with your references sufficient or would I be taking a big risk without professional advice? I'm very, very pleased to have that question. You're absolutely right. Um, it, it, there is a big risk. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, particularly insulating without ventilating. So the joist ends in the damp wall is something I have nightmares about, um, Lucy. <laughs> so how, do, how does Chris get... Um, can I just has 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 it something? Uh, I think Historic England have got very good sort of detailed designs um, of all sorts of things. Are you, are you yeah. a fan of them? Um, thank you, Chris. And it's really nice to have a builder here too. Um, um, you know, Tony will know that we've been working with builders for several years on a project called Future Proof to try and arm them with exactly the kind of knowledge and skills that you're talking about. Um, if if the project's big enough that you can afford to, or your client can afford to pay for um, an architect or a surveyor or somebody competent, I would suggest that I would, wouldn't I? Because I'm an architect. But um, then you don't have to bring yourself completely up to speed. But if you can't afford that, um, come along to our Future Proof Essentials course. Um, it's it's an online um, set of ten pre records. Um, and it will give you a lot of the information you need to do the project well. Could I just interject there? Um, I because... thought you might. <laughs> we do have a number of fully funded places for builders on the Future Proof Essentials course that Lucy is talking about. So please, please get in contact with us after this and we will put you, we will gladly put you on that course. Um, We've got those available through Future Ready Homes because we're really keen to support local builders um, to help you, to help you do this well and feel confident doing it um, and to provide the services that people on this call are looking for. Um, oh, so, yeah, brilliant, can... Gemma. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right, I'm going to rush on. I'm afraid we've still got more questions. Um, uh, on that subject of um, recommended installers uh, and well-trained installers, uh, a question, is there a list of recommended installers uh, for internal or, or cavity wall insulation um, in Hereford and Worcestershire? Um, so Future Ready Homes is endeavouring to create a list of such installers that who have been um, used by householders across the, the marches, including Shropshire and Powys. Uh, that is coming together. It is taking time. It's painstaking work. Uh, Green Doors, I must say, was a great opportunity to go and talk to householders who have employed contractors and and uh, learn from their experience that's just finished um but yes we are on it um so the question for you lucy is uh we obviously haven't discussed it talking about solid wall property um can you give us a view on cavity wall insulation um if it's a very um well regarded installer i think that could be a good solution if you've got you know you've got a cavity the reason why i caveat that is what i alluded to earlier is whether or not you can uh, guarantee that it's fully filling the cavity for example if you ask the installer um if they'd be willing to do a thermal image um post installation before you pay them um that might be a good way to give you some reassurance that the cavity's been fully filled yeah very good point um so. Can I just say, actually, um, Tony, for, especially for those who are considering doing work, you know, there's a culture in the UK that we assume builders are cowboys and uh, do poor work. And, you know, there's been lots of press very recently about that. And that is true. But there are an awful lot of really 
good, competent, proficient builders out there. Futureproof has got um, a good pool of um, really good builders and contractors. So don't be afraid to to start the work. Um, uh, you know, if you go to Futureproof, you can find a list of those. And, and Tony, it sounds like you, you're getting a really great list of, of recommendations too. Um, there's some really good people out there. It's not all cowboy country. Yeah, yeah. well said indeed. Um, point from Jackie, uh, going back to windows, um, good quality timber is likely to have a longer lifespan than uh, UPVC. And there are the resource and waste stream issues to consider. Quite right. Um, um, unfortunately we live we, we move house about every seven years in this country apparently and so the long-term kind of payback or longevity of products isn't always at people's forefront of their minds hmm. um, um back to the um internal in wall insulation and the um well, the floor joist. Lou's question is, continuity is often impossible then. Due to floor joists, do we give up at that point? No, we don't. It, it is not impossible to, um, well, it's a matter of removing the skirting and, and a few floorboards. Um, I hope. Yeah, it, and also, not, you know, we could, we could have done it um, from underneath too. Um, because the floor joists were rotten, we had to take them up in, anyway. But if you've got a crawl space, you can actually friction fit something like wood fiber from underneath between the the joists and then just put chicken wire to keep it in place hmm. um, so yeah don't give up okay um how do you rate sheep's wool insulation hasn't had a mention today very highly but it's expensive um if you get something like thermo fleece or black country um uh sheep's wool you're purchasing it from within the uk and that's not a kind of call to patriotism or anything, but it just does mean that it hasn't had the transportation um, additional impacts from getting it from New Zealand or where the some of the sheep's wool comes from. Um, uh, you know, Christine Armstrong decades ago identified two problems which we didn't have, UK made sheep's wool and UK sheep farmers couldn't give away the fleeces because we don't wear wool anymore. We just chew up plastic bottles and make them into fleeces. So she put two problems together and made a solution, which was thermofleece. Um, it's a fantastic product. It's a natural insulin. So there's places you can't put it. You couldn't put it in a cavity, for example, mm. but it's extremely breathable. You know, it's why um, sheep can live on the side of a Welsh mountain in the middle of winter because they can absorb more than 30% of the weight in moisture before they even start to lose the thermal capabilities. Mm. So wool is fantastic. And I love to wear it too. It's a great material. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, right, we're back to cavities. We have a 1930s house with a 20 mil cavity, sometimes called a finger cavity. It's um, local firm says they can't fill it because it's too narrow so what can we do with that that is an interesting question presumably hmm. externally insulating um isn't going to be a great idea because there is a cavity so the thermal mass benefit is not there or have i completely got that wrong well um you'd have to figure out what you do with the wheat holes in the cavity so the cavity has wheat holes so that if any moisture gets into the cavity there's a way of the water getting out so if you're going to leave the cavity unfilled and then insulate on the outside, you've got to leave a way of that cavity to be drained. Um, I have heard somebody putting in some external wall insulation on an uninsulated cavity. Um, it, it kind of does warm up the wall because it becomes a sort of thermal mass. But because you have to have this ventilation in the cavity, you're going to get cold air there. So it, I, personally, I think it's of minimal um value yeah. and you'd probably want to do an internal wall insulation i mean 20 mil is tiny for a cavity yeah hmm. um okay um we have a suggestion uh seven y energy agency who are our, our partners um in the future ready homes project um have been working with a contractor called evolve uh who, who we also know they um, have been recommended for cavity uh, wall insulation if you're interested excellent um, um right okay so the other uh end of what we were just talking about sometimes a filled cavity building can also have external wall insulation do you have experience of that 
Does that does that work? Does that mean you benefit from the thermal mass? Yeah, you do. Um, I mean, that's quite an expensive solution. I have heard of projects where they do that. Um, so you're you're removing the coal cavity and the the uh, cold air that's moving around the cavity, and you're also providing this tea cozy on the outside. I'm sure it's all in the detail, but I have heard that that's been done. Right. Um, if there's no more questions, we still have 55 people attending, so hopefully you all found that interesting. Uh, no. Um, have we got no more questions? I think we're there. Lucy, you look like okay. you're, um, you're running out of puff, which is fair enough. Thank you very much. for. Um, so I better hand back to Jem for some wrapping up. Yes, thank you. Oh, thanks to everyone for all your questions as well. There's some brilliant ones in there. Um, really good discussion as well about um, installers are obviously such a key part to this. Um, so thank you everyone for bringing that up and discussing it so well. Um, right, so that brings us on to what we've got coming up um, next for you. We don't just want to leave you there as you're all so keen to talk about retrofit and get on with some hopefully. Um, so on the 10th of November, um, a week, two weeks on Friday, Friday the 10th of November anyway, um, we have got some in-person DIY in wood fibre internal wall insulation training taking place. So um, Lucy obviously mentioned wood fibre quite a lot there and, and the benefits of that as a as a product. Um, yeah, and we've got a, a free day of um, training for you guys that are thinking about doing either doing it yourselves DIY or just getting yourselves more skilled up and competent and confident with the materials to then um, engage with an installer as well um, so that you yeah you feel happier with that process so if you are interested I'll be sharing a link to um, that that you can sign up for um, it's all day 10 till 4 and um, you will be getting your hands dirty it is not just a, a stand on the side and watch so it's for those that are really keen um, it will be outside as well so it might be chilly but please come along we will be providing you with lunch um, and that is sure to be a, yeah a fun day and getting to work with these different natural materials which is great um, then of course we've got more webinars coming up and um, we've got a, a big series for you actually taking us to Christmas. Um, so 14th of November, how to insulate roofs and sloping ceilings. Um, that's something that came up, the the intricacies and difficulties potentially of doing that. So um, that's going to be a really interesting session. Um, that is supported by the Green Register as well, as is how to retrofit the Victorian Terrace on the 27th of November. So that's a more specific dive into that particular property type. Um, ventilation and air tightness, again, something that's come up today. So we're going to do a deeper dive into that on the 4th of December, um, well worth coming along to. And then on the 12th of December, it's about how to retrofit the modern home, um, by which I'm talking about modern construction. So that's more post 1930s. Um, and that will be talking about your cavity walls that will be coming up a lot more there um, mm. and things like that. And then we've also got Ask an Expert. So we're still here to give advice. If you have more questions um, about your retrofit, about what Lucy's been speaking about or anything else, um, Future Ready Homes has a, a team of experts um, waiting to help deal with your inquiries. Um, so send them in and we'll put them, we'll put them to the team and publish um, those on the Future Ready Homes website so that we can all learn from that advice that's being given out. Um, yeah, so that is everything for the time being, just a few things to, to keep you busy. Um, that will all come out to you on email, along with the recording. If I can get the chat from before and from this, I'll share the chat too. I'll share Lucy's slides, all of those brilliant guides that she mentioned as well. So you'll have lots and lots of materials um, and all the links to the webinars and that um, internal wall insulation training as well. Um, so that will all be winging its way to you later on this week, probably tomorrow, but possibly Wednesday. Um, yeah, that's everything. So thank you once again, Lucy. Really, really, really brilliant talk there. Thanks to all of you for sticking with us, coming back, staying to the end. Um, it, it's been excellent. And we'll see thank you next you. time. Thanks, Emma. Yeah.